The following program is paid for by Time of Grace Ministry. Time of Grace is an international Christian outreach media ministry that's dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with as many people as possible. The ministry uses television, print, and the internet to share the gospel with people across the country and around the world. Each week at this time, Pastor Jeske presents Bible studies in terms that people can relate to and apply to their lives. And now, Time of Grace. Every October, professional athletes add a color to their outfits. What color is it? Some people may think that Christianity goes back only to Christmas time, to the birth of Christ. Actually, that is just the next step in a plan that God has been unfolding since the beginning of human history. Our faith goes back to the very beginning. In this Advent season, I'm bringing you a new series of Bible studies called Moses and the Messiah. And Moses told us about God's first promise of a Savior. In the Garden of Eden, right after Adam and Eve had first sinned, God came with his promise of a rescuer who's going to come, like the Susan G. Komen Foundation, with nothing less than coming for the cure. I want to celebrate with you in my Bible study today how Jesus was promised already in the Garden of Eden who was going to be a champion who would crush the devil's head. I'd like to invite you to take your Bible with me and go to Genesis chapter 3. I feel really bad for people who believe in evolution or who think that these things aren't historical. If you dump the narratives in Genesis, you have no explanation for all of the important questions of our lives. It's like building a house on a swamp without a foundation, without a basement. It won't stand up uh, to the flow of water. It won't stand up to any shaking or movement. It will simply collapse. If you try to build a house in this land, just starting to nail boards together and set them on the ground, your house is going to fall down. It needs a foundation. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are a non-negotiable foundation without which none of the rest of the Bible makes any sense whatsoever. If you don't accept Genesis' explanation, you have no explanation at all of why are we so cruel and violent towards each other. But you also would miss out on God's first trump card because he already at the time of our human moral collapse had a rescue plan already in place. We're going to read about that today. Here is the first example of Moses and the Messiah from Moses' first book. We leave the description of paradise in chapter 2, the Garden of Eden, fabulous place, beautiful, and an abundance of everything they needed. And in the middle were two important trees that God built and loaded each with significance. One of them was a tree of immortality, If you would eat that fruit, God would um, put immortality into you. And it suggests that after a time of God's choosing, if Adam and Eve had contented themselves with God's structure and lived decent, righteous lives, which they could because they weren't born sinful like us, they would have been invited to eat of this tree of immortality and then heaven would have been on earth and, and they would have loved their lives. The second tree was basically church, was Adam and Eve's church. It was where they demonstrated their obedience to God and their love for God by not eating of it. They didn't need it for food. They had an abundance of food. The the trees of the rest of the garden were groaning with produce. All they had to do was go and pick it up. But this was an opportunity for them to use their independence of action that God built into them. And here... Here also is something, if you ditch Genesis 3, you will miss the fundamental answer to the riddle of 
why, of why stuff happens. Here, here it is. I'm going to lay it out for you. There is only one possible explanation of why God would allow the devil to run loose among his dear children, whom he loved with all his heart. And that is that he does not want you to be his sock puppets, where you lie there in a drawer, limp and useless, till he puts his hands in you and starts talking. You are not merely a marionette, and he is the puppeteer, where you basically hang around here like this, waiting until he picks up the strings above you, and suddenly you jump back into life, and he drives everything. He made you to be miniature versions of himself with independence of thought, independence of will, the ability to make decisions that matter, and consequences of either high risk or horrible risk, high risk for good or evil. And gave us the dignity, C.S. Lewis called it, the dignity of causality, of the, what you say and do in your life really matters. And you can bring about great good or great harm in what you do. And that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was church for Adam and Eve. That is where they would worship. That is where they would show their obedience, that they accepted the fact they were down here and God was up here. And they also, it was their place to worship him, that they believed his words, that eating that fruit was spiritual suicide, and they would stay away from it that they accepted his word, that they would introduce death into their lives if they ate of it. Now, here's one of many things I'd like to know. How long is the gap between Genesis 2 and 3? God didn't think I needed to know, and he doesn't think you need to know either. But uh, there's a missing chapter in here of uh, information provided elsewhere in Scripture that is then told as basically flashbacks that I will help sketch in here for you, and that is that there was a, re a revolt in heaven. And Lucifer, one of the archangels, one of the supreme high command of God's angel armies, led a revolt with, uh, the Bible says, his, the tail of the dragon swept a third of the stars out of the sky. So a, uh, less than a majority, but a, still a sizable chunk of the angels rebelled with Satan, and they refused this inferior status and had a test of strength. And uh, the Lord God and St. Michael and the righteous angels prevailed and threw him out of heaven. And now his name changed from Lucifer, the light bearer, to Satanas, the adversary or the enemy. And he was plunged into damnation. And yet he was allowed to have access to the earth. That part uh, we find out about later. So when we see Adam and Eve, some time has passed. But they enjoyed Shabbat, Sabbath, an absolutely serene, perfect relationship with their God for some undisclosed amount of time. But then the snake slithered up. And here's a question, how, how many am I up to, 12? Wouldn't Eve have thought something was amiss when a talking snake starts suggesting things that uh, she knew she wasn't supposed to do? So. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, we're not going to go through all this ugly dialogue one by one, but let's just sum up what happened. You know the story, and if you don't, you better read it, because you need to know this before you get old and die. Here's what went on. Satan sent Eve several powerful messages. One, you can't trust God. He's not looking out for your best interest. It's like he's a salesman. He gets a commission. He gets something out of it, I'm jerking you around. Can't trust him. You got to look out for you. Kick off the restraint. Rules, schmools. Have fun. Oh, why should you be down here? You're being deprived of things you ought to enjoy, things you have a right to do. You should be able to decide for yourself what's good and bad. Don't be put in a box by somebody who's treating you like a child. Take control of your life. This, don't, you've, you know that voice, right? The whispering of the snake talk coming at you, whispering lies to you. You've heard these lies in your life too, haven't you? Well, it worked. And in two different ways. Eve bought the lie 
and ate the fruit. Could have been an apple or more likely not. It, it's, it's some kind of fruit. Doesn't, the kind doesn't matter. And experienced the wicked thrill of knowing now from experience what it's like to be a rebel. It always is fun for the moment, and then comes the guilt and the shame. And suddenly, she thought, holy smokes, I don't have a stitch of clothes on. And it wasn't that she just forgot to get dressed. There was no shame in, a, in, her, in the Garden of Eden, in their perfect world. Suddenly, she knew the feelings of shame and embarrassment and needed to hide. Adam is worse. He's supposed to be leading this merry little band. He's supposed to be the dad, the husband and the dad. He's supposed to be a leader, supposed to be strong. The Bible says he wasn't deceived, so he didn't fall for the lies. His, though, his sin is worse. He ate the fruit cold-bloodedly to join Eve's rebellion, even though he knew better. That was worse. He wanted to experience what she was experiencing and be there with her. So he took her side instead of God's. There is no good explanation for it. And he also felt the hot shame and guilt and was hiding. Here's another mystery. Here, what are, what are, what, how many mysteries are we up to? Number 14? I don't know, whatever. God comes to earth to have a conversation, and he takes a stroll in the cool of the day. Perhaps God waited, maybe he waited to let them simmer and marinate in their new bad vibes, and he let them think about it. It's maybe like, uh, you know, what my mother used to do. She, made me, she would make me sit in a chair until dad came home. That's, that's terrible for a kid. You know how antsy and ADD kids all are? Sitting still and waiting for dad to bring down the lumber is like almost worse. I almost want, wanted to go get her like a rubber scotch spoon and say, spank me now and let's get it over with this. The waiting is killing me. Maybe God wanted them to marinate in their shame for a while and think about what they had done before they had to talk. And he comes down now. If I was God, I would have done a Mount Sinai thing and boom! Who, like, fee, fi, fo, fum, who ate the sacred fruit off of my tree? I'd have really shown how upset I was. And instead, God takes a stroll, a dusk stroll. You know, Adam says, my man, where are you? Adam said, I heard you, but I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid. That's us now, cowering, shaken, shaken, trying to, where can you run? You can run, but you can't hide. Where can you hide from God? His eyes see everything. I'm, I'm hiding. He said, who said you were naked? Who said you needed clothes? Or like, you got something to tell me? Have you eaten from the tree? Adam does what we always do, blame someone else. He blames Eve. So God doesn't yell at him for that stupid response. He just says, and Eve, talk to me, Eve. My daughter, my beautiful, beautiful daughter, talk to me. And she blames the snake, naturally. It, it can't, it's not me. It's just like me, that thing did it to me. And instead of yelling at him, the first thing that God does is to announce disaster on Satan. Now this is you got to realize these are God's first cards, so it's sort of obscure, it's prophetic, it's in sort of poetic language, and he puts down some ideas that are put in sort of poetic form and just lets them there for us to think about and savor. You might say, well, why doesn't he have a paragraph here with, more, with a little clearer explanation? Go argue with God when you see him. I'm just telling you, this is what he did. He said... Cursed are you above all livestock. You're going to eat dust. Now, that's a puzzle, isn't it? First of all, why yell at the snake? It's, animals don't have human intelligence. We pretend they do. In, in Disneyland, they do, but not in real life. They, animals don't talk. This, it isn't the fault of this particular animal that the human race disintegrated and drank the Kool-Aid with that poison in it. Snakes like to crawl on the ground. That's how they're made. So this isn't a curse on animals per se. This is God's indirect way of telling Satan, what a loser you are. You think you win. You're going to eat dirt, Satan. More uh, back to you later. Then 
before he yells at Adam and Eve. And he will. He's going to announce to each what they had done to make their lives hard and painful. But before he gets to that, even before he gets to the thing about the weeds and the woman now having much pain in childbirth, your husband's going to hurt you, your children are going to hurt you, Adam, your work is going to fight you, and you will now hate your job. And man, every man and woman who's ever lived has experienced to the full what Father Adam and Mother Eve have given to us. Before he gets to the bad news, he has marvelous news, and Moses gives you a Messiah. Here is God's first card of his rescue. And already at the moment of the disaster, he announces the rescue plan. And you have to imagine now that he's talking, God is talking to Satan, and he announces three powerful concepts I want you to understand and hang on to with both arms, with a grip of steel, and never let go. Because these are important concepts. Are you ready? Here's concept number one. Satan, you think you have now seduced and poisoned the whole human race and that they all belong to you, that they will now listen to you. Wrong. I'm going to put enmity, hatred, between that woman who you think now is your slave. She is not, I will not allow her to be your slave. She's going to hate you and everything you stand for. See, right now in hell, Satan's going around, We are the champions. They're, they're doing the We Will Rock You song in hell. We won. We win. They're doing their victory lap, screeching their foul orc sounds and, and all that other kind of stuff. You don't win. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Second, there is going to be warfare between all who follow Eve. She is going to stay a believer, which means she's going to stay God's daughter. And there will be clashes between believers and unbelievers. Anyone who follows Satan. Satan's going to try to torment them, but God's going to keep them safe. There will be enmity and hatred between your offspring and hers. And finally, one particular offspring. She is going to have a son who is coming. And God didn't say when, but here's what this face card looks like. It's the king card. It's the king of hearts who loves you dearly. It's also the king of clubs who's got a weapon. He is going to crush your head, though you will strike his heel. And here's the image. Satan is like a serpent. Back in that day, warfare was not long range. Now, if you're in the armed forces, you, if you are ever in combat, you will almost certainly never have even seen your opponent. Combat is almost completely not hand-to-hand -hand anymore. Back in the day, it was all hand-to-hand. -hand. And our Savior went mano a mano with Satan, and, or mano a fang with Satan, I guess you'd say. And here's the image that he comes up close enough for the snake to lash out and sink its fangs into his body, like in his heel. But in that very moment when he commits himself and gives what appears to be a mortal wound to the hero, Eve's son, with a capital S, he brings his heel up and crushes the head of the snake so that the snake loses. And what looked to be a mortal, deadly wound on the hero he, he recovers from it and wins. He's the victor. Here is the first of the Messiah cards that God plays, the first message to give people hope. And I encourage you to grab onto these things with all your heart and to believe them. First, God has not given up and earnestly desires your soul and heart to live with him forever so you can live in the new paradise. We all are struggling and groaning for the cure, worse than the cancer cure. We're struggling for a cure of death, the, the death that haunts and stalks us all. Advent is a time to express that longing. Tell God how sad you are at the people you've had to let go of. Tell God how afraid you are to die yourself. Tell God of your anxiety over people you love, whose health, whose lives look like they're going down. Tell it. Advent is the time for that, to express our longing for the cure. But claim God's love. He said, I am not going to let Eve go. You can't have her. I'm going to put enmity between you and her. I want her 
claim that desire, for you are loved and forgiven as well. Recognize, number two, that you're in a war, that there is enmity between the believers and the unbelieving world. You are not going to live in an easy, comfortable life. Your life is going to be hard. It's only a question of which pieces of your life is it going to be hard. But all of us have hardship stories to tell each other, pain stories, frustration stories. We're all longing for the cure. But hang on, because the champion did come once, as he said. And on Calvary, our Lord Jesus had five snake bites in his beautiful body, and he let the serpent attack him, and the fang marks were in each hand and in his beautiful feet, and one driven into his side. But what looked like a deadly wound actually became the crushing of Satan. And on the cross, Jesus crushed the skull of the serpent. Satan is now a broken, dying creature, dying forever. And the, the only damage he can do is when people allow it or choose the damage. We have the cure. Through faith in Christ, we are cured and healed of that snake bite in us. You are forgiven and loved by God, and on, in his court, you are not guilty of sin. You are immortal. And so what looks like when death finally chops you down, it's going to look like a mortal wound, like the ultimate finally happened. But the joke's on Satan, for you yourself will crush death's head itself, personally reenacting Jesus' resurrection. And you are immortal and deathless. Don't let Satan talk you out of it to jump back in his arms, but claim what Christ has done for you, what our Messiah has done. He's crushed the head of the serpent for you. And now you and I are immortal, and we're on our way to a grand reunion. Satan's doomed. He's not the king of hell. He's prisoner number 00001. You and I are destined and chosen for a grand wedding and a grand adventure. This is good news for God's people. Say amen. We have a question from a viewer that I think you might find interesting, especially in view of the Bible study we just had on the temptation brought to Eve by one of the fallen angels, now called Lucifer or the devil. Here's the viewer's question. If the devil was an angel in heaven, how could he have sinned? In other words, wasn't everything pure and perfect in heaven? God didn't create evil. Where did evil come from? There is really only one possible answer for that important, important question. And that is that it was so important to God that his human creatures and his angel creatures would choose to love him and serve him back, that he built them with the ability to choose evil as well, with the consequences attached, so that the love and service they would give would be given freely. It was not controlled or mandated or forced out of them. It would need to be chosen and given freely. And it appealed to Satan, the, the ringleader, and some of his fellow angels that they thought that serving God was demeaning and they wanted their independence, wanted their own sovereignty, fought a titanic battle in heaven and were thrown to earth. But that same choice, that same pressure and temptation was then brought to our human creatures. And you and I have suffered the consequences ever since. Jesus came for the cure. He came to restore us to that angelic existence where we will no longer again ever sin or even suffer the temptation to sin when we finally get to heaven. I'll be back to pray with you in just a moment. I'm so excited to tell you about this new project I've done for Time of Grace. It's 365 devotions called Dig In, a way to share the sweet news of God with the children and grandchildren in your life. 
There is also a section written by kids for kids, so they can tell each other the good news of Jesus. To order, please visit www.timeofgrace.org or call 1-800-661-3311. I'm thrilled to have a chance to say thank you to all of you whose gifts and contributions have made this broadcast possible. It's a miracle, isn't it, that we can be talking together with hundreds of thousands of people sharing good news of the coming Christmas miracle. You know, people don't know that by nature. It has to be revealed. You and I are part of a team that make that communication possible to reach out and plant saving faith in people's hearts. Heaven will have more people in it because of what you and I are doing together. If you have not recently made a financial contribution to Time of Grace, let me ask you today to pray and consider becoming part of the team so that we can share the good news that there is a cure, there is hope, there is eternity all through Jesus. I'd like to pray with you this Advent season. Let's come before God's throne. Heavenly Father, we thank you for keeping the promises that you've made. You never forgot what you said. You said a champion was coming and you sustained the hopes of your people for thousands of years. You kept your promise. Lord Jesus, thank you for being willing to be that champion, to suffer so much to be able to crush the serpent's head for us. Holy Spirit, give us two things, we pray. Faith to believe and seize and claim and hold on to our faith in this wonderful champion, our Savior Jesus, but also the grace and skill and compassion to share this good news with people who are afraid, who are afraid of their own guilt, who are afraid of Satan and afraid of death. We have good news of the cure, and it comes through Jesus alone. It's in his name we pray, amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske assuring you each day is a day of God's amazing grace for you. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org and pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching and join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. Thank you for watching Time of Grace with Pastor Mark Jeske. Time of Grace is an international Christian outreach media ministry that's dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with as many people as possible. The ministry uses television, print, and the internet to share the gospel with people across the country and around the world. This program has been paid for by Time of Grace Ministry.